I would like to say that uh, Russia actually worked uh, in the area of uh, pseudo-exfoliative syndrome. My publications and publications of my co-authors referred in the beginning of 1990s that was antioxidant activity of uh, aqueous solution about transport function of albumin. And uh, for the first time, we introduced ophthalmo endotoxicosis. This is exact, exactly exfoliative glaucoma. We studied penetration of hemato-exfoliative barrier. Everything is published in Russian. So so totally illiterate to you and to other colleagues, so nobody read us and nobody knew about us. But later on, we made a very big epidemiological study in the central Russia, together with Professor Strachov, Ryabtseva, Brezhnev, Kapkova. So all that is also published, and we found out that in the central part of Russia, glaucoma patients demonstrated pseudo-exfoliative syndrome in 85% of cases, 8-5. And one more comment. In one of our first symposiums, because today is already six uh, symposium, in one of the first, academician Cherishnev made a uh, wonderful presentation on prion-like diseases. And he was really very wise uh, scientist. He suggested that glaucoma could be manifestation of a prion-like diseases, including pseudo-exfoliative glaucoma. Today we see how much was done by Professor Rich in this area. And I have a very logical question. Don't you think that we are slowly moving to the understanding that pseudo-exfoliation syndrome is early manifestation of prion-like diseases. And this is my first question. And my second question about this very interesting... Because you're going on here with a whole... You're going on with a lot of things that I could, I could talk about. So let's start with that one. First of all, uh, we get the Russian papers here and I just get them translated. So we have all the Russian literature. You don't have to worry. Uh, the second thing is this albumin. You mentioned albumin, and there are only a couple of papers about that. <clears throat> There's been nothing lately, and it, I would just raise the question here because I can't answer it. Is there, is there a role of albumin in transporting uh, molecules either into the cell, out of the cell, within the cell, or within uh, the bloodstream is biomarkers in exfoliation syndrome. Now, let's mention prion disorders. Look, somewhere, somewhere along the line, I don't know how many years ago, uh, maybe it's about eight or nine years ago, I was in Prague or Budapest, and I said, you know, exfoliation is a potentially reversible preventable, reversible, and maybe even curable disease. I've been looking at this my whole life, my ever since I was a fellow. And these are different diseases. You saw that diagram that I put up with all of glaucoma on one slide. Well, all of these diseases are different specific diseases. Exfoliation syndrome, pigment dispersion syndrome, Myocillin, juvenile open angle glaucoma, they have completely distinct appearances. The only reason we call secondary glaucomas secondary is because you can see something at the slit lamp. And primary open angle glaucoma means you don't see something at the, at the slit lamp. There's nothing to see except the eye. But these could be 40. We hypothesized when we wrote our first book in 1986 that these could be 40 different diseases based on genetics. Okay, and we suggested calling it idiopathic open angle glaucoma rather than primary, so that as we discovered causes, we could take them away. And then we got down to the causes. I always said these are meant, every one of these diseases has a specific mechanism specific genetic, biochemical, cell biological, pathophysiological, and uh, translational mechanism that leads to damage to the trabecular meshwork and elevated intraocular pressure. Okay, and any, nobody in this country, nobody in the United States cared about exfoliation. I, I was the only one. 
and a couple of there were a couple of others. And Barbara Streeton, uh, who I worked with many years ago, uh, who uh, at the same time as Ursula Sartre Schreyer published exfoliation as being uh, a systemic disorder. And I always said, if you wait till a patient has glaucoma, you're behind the game, you've lost. You have to discover the mechanisms and discover how to interfere with the mechanism to prevent the disease. But nobody listened. Uh, that's all right. It didn't bother me because I, I listened. Now, we go to the, what are the different causes? And there, there are potentially a lot of different causes, of genetic causes, but my concept is that all, all diseases in the end have either a genetic or an infectious component. And there were a couple of papers along the way, one by uh, Ringvold in Norway showing a virus particle next to the meshwork. Uh, a couple of people did, uh, and then Arrakis, I think it was in Greece, showed uh, herpes virus in aqueous 14% uh, of people with exfoliation. <clears throat> there are four papers in the literature. This is, I really love this. I wish somebody would do something with it because nobody's done anything for, for 15 years. There are four papers in the literature with 12, total of 12 patients who received corneal donor transplants from older people while they were in their late 20s and early 30s and developed exfoliation syndrome. That really suggests that there's an infectious disease here. And what could it be? Obviously, it's not bacterial. I don't think it's viral. And when I started, when we started talking about prion disorders, when prion disorders first came out, when Prusiner, when, when Stan Prusiner discovered them, uh, Carlton Geidusek got the Nobel Prize for Kuru back in 76. Uh, then these other, these other spongiform encephalopathies that were attributed to prions like uh, Halivoid and Spatz disease or uh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? I can't think of it right off the top of my head. There, there are several of them. Uh, at any rate, those were just the extreme end, the extreme end of the spectrum. And then people started finding, just like conformational disorders, conformational disorders, at first there were a few, then there were more. Now there's pages of conformational disorders. Cataract is a conformational disease. Macular degeneration is conformational. Obviously, exfoliation syndrome is conformational. And so, at the same, at the, in the same aspect, along the same lines of reasoning, more and more prion disorders are being discovered, and now we talk about slow prion disorders. Alzheimer's may be one. There may be other factors also, but there may be prion diseases could begin when you're 20 years old and take 40 years to show up symptomatically or visually or at the slit lamp. And so I, there's a very good possibility, at least, I don't know, yeah, I think one, one possibility, and this has been in the literature now for 15 years, is that exfoliation syndrome may be a slow prion disorder, and I think this is discoverable with an aphometrix chip. We started to do this. We started to do this about eight years ago. Uh, with aphometrics chips, which can differentiate at that time to differentiate 400 different uh, different um, infectious disorders from bacteria to viruses to chlamydia to slow viruses to prions. Due to unfor an unfortunate circumstance, uh, it didn't. We collected the specimens but then they were lost, and we never really did this again. I hope somebody sitting over there in the audience 
would like to take up this uh, this investigation and look for prions in exfoliation material. And we too you found the same thing that you did. We had, you know, back uh, 20 years ago, we had a lot of Russian immigrants in New York. 75% had exfoliation syndrome. It is all over the place. Americans used to think it was a Scandinavian disease. You couldn't publish a paper uh, on exfoliation syndrome unless it was a really great, unusual paper in the U.S. literature. Everybody just sent their papers to ACTA. But it is all over the world. It may be less in some countries. It's rare in southern China. But you look at places like Norway, Finland, Russia, okay, 70% of the, I was in Kazakhstan, 70% uh, of the patients they showed me had exfoliation syndrome. But I think there's a lot to do, and there's a great deal of work and research that could be done in Russia on this because it's so common. So that's my comment on prions. Now, uh, Natasha, why don't, you go on? Oh, one, you. why don't you go on with the next question? You see why I had to take one oh, question? Thank you. At the, why I had to take one question at a time? Thank you. Okay, okay thank you, Mr. Rich. So my second question is about your comments on the overlap syndrome, which you mentioned in your presentation. So overlap syndrome, as we see, uh, uh, when uh, pseudo-exfoliation syndrome uh, overlaps with uh, pigment dispersion syndrome. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that they are uh, logically related to each other. And these are two separate diseases. The pigment dispersion begins when people are in their early 20s, and it's an autosomal, autosomal dominant disease. The problem was that they used to think that people under the age of 35 never had glaucoma. And they were completely wrong. I mean, it was a crazy thought, but that's how people thought here. I, was, I remember I was on TV talking about pediatric glaucoma all the time and talking about pigmentary glaucoma and pigment dispersion syndrome. And whoever was interviewing me said, well, people under 35 don't get glaucoma, do they? And I said, yeah, that's what they say, but I have 3,000 of them in my database. And I remember a medical student, this was the greatest case, all of the pigment dispersions used to come in blind in one eye because people didn't have their pressures taken. Or they, they had all the signs and nobody paid attention to them. I have pigment dispersion syndrome. I got trained by the person who trained me, missed it twice. I never looked at my, she just said, okay, your eye looks fine. Uh, it was missed. People stared right at it and missed it. So I remember one medical student came in. He was finger counting in his left eye. And he was a medical, he had gone to the, he had blurred vision. He had gone to the department in his medical school. He said maybe he had glaucoma, take his pressure, check him for glaucoma. They refused. They said you're only 23 years old. You're too young to get glaucoma, and they refused to check his pressure. When he came to me, he had a pressure of 50, and he was blind in one eye. Uh, and that's the way the situation was. Well, we did a study in 1994, epidemiologic study, showing that about 2.5% of the Caucasian population had pigment dispersion. Okay, that's 10 times what people thought before. It was published first as a rare disease in 1949 with two cases. In 1964, there was a review of 125 cases in the world literature. It was thought to be relatively rare because only 5 to 10% was diagnosed. And we did a careful epidemiologic study in uh, 1994. I think it was published in the uh, American Journal of Ophthalmology. We found 2.5%. It's a, basically a Caucasian gene. 2.5% had it. So that translated to about 400, 4 million people in the U.S. because it only affects myopes, 80% myopes, 20% emetropes. 
None of the patients that we discovered had ever heard of the word, and only three out of 18 had a family history of glaucoma. We estimated that there were 4 million people in the gene in the, in the U.S. carrying the gene for pigment dispersion. And if you want to stretch it and say, well, hyperopes don't get pigment dispersion, you can for 8 million people with the gene for pigment dispersion. So let's say 400,000 people get pigmentary glaucoma, half of which is missed. I'm telling you, it's the most, one of the most misdiagnoses. And then it burns itself out when they're in their late 40s and the, with the decrease in accommodation, they stop releasing pigment and the pigment in the meshwork and the pigment in the, in the, the, uh, the Krugenberg spindles the iris transillumination defects gradually go away and you lose the signs of pigment dispersion except for the pigment reversal sign. And it goes away. Now these people are, you know, let's say 50 years old, 55 years old, 60 years old, and all of the signs basically of pigment dispersion have gone away, but they had pigmentary glaucoma when they were in their, tw in their 20s. Now they get exfoliation. So what we did, we call it overlap syndrome just to make a name. Uh, and we recognized it because we would have people who had a history of bilateral pigment dispersion and they were controlled for a long time, for years, and now the, pig, the pressure went up in one eye. Now the pressure goes up in one eye when you have bilateral burned out pigmentary, the first thing I think of is, exfol is exfoliation. When we wrote this up, we had five cases in our first paper. My mother was one of them. Then our second paper had 35 cases, then I stopped counting. So it's very common, but there's no etiologic relationship. You just have to look for it and think of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished colleagues, now uh, we are having uh, uh, simultaneous webcasts with New York and with Cambridge. Professor Rich, we have tons of questions to you from Russia, from Russian regions, and also many questions to Professor Keith Martin from Cambridge as well. So I would like to ask our IT engineers to uh, switch on to Astrakhan, which is Caspian Sea region of Russian Federation. So, you see that our speakers are true scientists, so we can speak the whole day, but unfortunately, we have a busy schedule for today, so, so many doctors are listening around Russian Federation. So, let's ask uh, the first question from Astrakhan. Good afternoon. Can we consider the widely used in Russia injection courses of Russian-made polypeptides of um, retinal and neural action as the complete neuroprotective glaucoma treatment. Russian-based polypeptides, anti-glaucoma treatment. Do you get the question? Do you get the question? <coughs> Well, this question is very clear to Russian ophthalmologists, and this is very relevant for all Russian ophthalmologists, but I'm afraid this question would be not very clear to our uh, international participants. So these are peptides uh, that were derived from the retina and from the brain of cattle, and this is either retrobulbar injection or intramuscular injection, and these are both uh, injections, and they're very popular in the Russian Federation, and they're used for years. That's why our colleagues uh, in Russia would like to know the position of our international experts about these particular uh, intrabulbar or intramuscular injections of the peptides derived from retina or brain of the cattle. Is the question clear? Please, colleagues, respond. Can you hear us? Colleagues, I would like to remind you that Professor Rich uh, came to his office at 7, 7 a.m., so the difference with New York is huge, it's huge, but, well, with Cambridge as well, so I cannot hear yet, I cannot hear, I lost the sound. Uh, 
Interpreter lost the sounds. I cannot hear, no sounds. Keith, we don't hear to you. Mm -hmm. it's I hear you, I hear you, thank you. It's nice, we can see you and hear you, thank you. Good, well, uh, thank you for the uh, question. So this is not a treatment which we uh, use in, in Europe or to my knowledge in the US. Uh, I have read a little bit about some of the work that has been done. I think what would really help with this sort of treatment if it is to become more widely used is uh, randomized controlled clinical trials, large, large clinical trials, preferably international clinical trials um, that would be very useful in establishing the extent to which this works. And I, I have read um, some papers suggesting uh, an effect on visual function, uh, but we, it's not a treatment which we have available in, in Europe, in other parts of Europe, to my knowledge. Bob, I presume this is not something which is available in the US either. Thank you very much. Yes, very complete answer, very complete answer. Any other questions from Astrakhan, dear colleagues from Astrakhan, Caspian Sea region? Any questions? So you see how randomized trials are important because it is just RCT can guide us in the future. No other options are possible in terms of treatment choice. So it becomes more and more obvious and for Russian ophthalmologists as well, although the whole world already reached that understanding, probably Russia is a little bit behind all that. <laughs> it's just interpreted. So, are we with New York? Uh, there is a feeling we lost New York because Professor Milieu would like to ask something from Professor Rich. Professor Milieu is in Moscow. He managed to arrive. Oh. Are you there? Yeah, can you, can you, can you hear me? I hear and I see you on, on, on the monitor, so... I'm okay, I'm who's asking, asking a question? I'm Stefano Miglior, uh, I'm here with, uh, with Natalia. Uh, I was listening to your presentation about the possibilities to avoid iris flapping on the lens. And I can't can hear. Can you hear? I can't, I can't hear. Do you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear. Okay, so... I was listening to your uh, discussion, to your proposal about ways to avoid uh, iris wrapping on the anterior capsule of the lens, okay? And you were suggesting the use of phylocarbon. Uh, well, I think, I think we, we already had this discussion a few years ago in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a big meeting in the States. And I, I, personally, I personally don't think they use phylocarbon in... Uh, in uh, Glaucoma is, is a really good suggestion, apart from what you are saying, that I agree, it may work. But unfortunately, the big problem with these eyes is uh, at, at a certain time, uh, lens extraction means fake homosification, and uh, it's uh, very well known how difficult it is to dilate this pupil. Uh, so, since uh, we know that in these patients, fake homosification by itself has a great potential to decrease IOP, actually a, a, a potential good way to avoid or any way to reduce iris wrapping on the anterior capsule would be just to practice a, a very early fake homosification. I would also propose a clear lens for homosification that may help in decreasing IOP quite a and in reducing the possibility to have uh, uh, high IOP in the future. What do you think about All right, there are about four different parts to that question. Uh, you, you want to know how to eliminate the iris rubbing over the lens so to decrease pigment release so that the trabecular meshwork doesn't get blocked, correct? Yeah. Okay. If well, the first thing that well, I use is 2% pilocarpine at bedtime. Okay, this is done. Every time I go to Europe, I get into this argument with, 
with Carlo Traverso and Tony Hammer. Uh, and I don't know if you we were in Milan when I get, was there a few months ago. Look, everybody thinks of pilocarpine as a four times a day drug. And they use four, think of 4% four times a day. And that gives you myotic pupils and, and all, the, all, the other, uh, all the other side effects associated with pilocarpine. We're not talking about doing that. All we want to do is stop the iris from rubbing over the lens. When the iris rubs over the lens, it scrapes off the exfoliation material, which goes to the trabecular meshwork and blocks it. And the, trabec the exfoliation material on the lens acts like sandpaper. And it scrapes the iris pigment epithelium. There were slides in this lecture that showed that. Okay, so pigment coming off the iris. Well, that pigment and exfoliation material goes to the trabecular meshwork and clogs the intertrabecular spaces. If you can stop the pupil from rubbing across the iris, and this is why more hyperopes have exfoliated glaucoma than myopes, because there's more contact in a smaller eye between the iris and the lens. One drop of 2% pilocarpine at bedtime. Okay, I'm not talking about four times a day. I'm not talking about using this to lower pressure during the day. And I'm not talking about giving them a one quarter of a millimeter pupil. One drop of 2% pilocarpine at bedtime gives a 24 hour action of a giving a three millimeter non-reactive pupil and okay. if you follow these I patients can see, you can see that the central disc builds up into a granular zone you get a granular zone and you stop releasing pigment and we've had pigment in the trabecular meshwork after patients have been treated with pilocarpine for a few years without who have decreased pigment in the meshwork. We also did, this, this became a problem. We did an eight center study, okay? We had an eight center, multi-center study testing pilocarpine against COSA. And pilocarpine came on ahead. Cambridge kit, I Well, dear colleagues, we have lots of questions on the neuroprotective treatment. I got many questions before the start of the conference from the regions, and still we have a whole flood of questions because uh, people are watching uh, uh, from us from all over the country. Unfortunately, Professor Martin will be able to stay with us just for 15 minutes. So can we have a connection with Cambridge? Cambridge? Do you have any questions, dear colleagues, here in the audience? Well, I understand that the, uh, the answers are very long, but nevertheless, you can uh, use this chance. Because Professor Rich uh, received many questions, so many questions about phacoemulsification as a method of treatment of pseudoexfoliative glaucoma. In fact, uh, the questions of our Russian colleagues exactly coincide what Professor Milio was asking Professor Rich about. So this is very logical. So if the lens is uh, a problem in this rubbing, so probably uh, there is a chance to remove it earlier. But Professor Rich has its own position about that. So yes. So this is very disputable, very disputable. So what about Cambridge connection? Can we re re uh, uh, restore? Natalia, I just want to finish yes. one point here that we have thought also of early lens removal in eyes with exfoliation to prevent glaucoma. For that, we need a long, randomized trial on patient eyes with early glaucoma without ex early exfoliation without glaucoma and do a lens extraction at the time of diagnosis to see if that prevents the development of glaucoma. That's the other half of the question. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, 
I have uh, one more question from the region, and uh, this question to Professor Martin and Professor Rich about the methods of assessment of neuroprotectors effectiveness. So do we have to check just visual fields? How to understand that the drugs are really working? And this is a question from the region. And my second question, how to explain that in some patients, even after the anti-glaucoma surgery and uh, reduction of the ophthalmotonus, uh, there is a dramatic improvement of the visual functions? There is a third question, do we need to give neuroprotectors to all patients, but yet we don't have uh, evidence-based data for this type of treatment. So, Professor Martin, are you ready to answer? If I could take the quick in turn. So, in terms of assessing the effectiveness of treatments that we think may be neuroprotective, I think functional measures are going to remain important. And uh, when we're thinking about this for a trial, we're planning for gene therapy in global we will be using functional outcome measures. So, we will use conventional visual fields testing. Now, there are ways you can shorten the length of trials that you need of neuroprotective uh, strategies, and one of the ways is to cluster the visual field analysis at the beginning and at the end of the follow-up period, which gives us more ability to detect that a progression has occurred in a shorter time. Um, also, recruiting patients who are uh, progressing um, so that we have uh, patients who are definitely progressing at the point of entry into the trial can be a way to enhance the ability to detect a treatment effect. We also need to measure structural measures and look at retinal ganglion cell complex and uh, nerve fiber layer thickness. And there are alternative ways coming in to look for depth of ganglion cells, for example, by labeling apoptosing retinal ganglion cells. And some of Francesco Cordero's work in London um, has produced very interesting results on the ability to distinguish um, between patients with progressive glaucoma and controls using labeling of apoptosing cells. And perhaps this will be something that we will uh, use in the future in our, in our trials. Um, but at the moment, I think it's important to use uh, visual fields as our, as our main uh, primary endpoint in neuroprotection studies. When it comes to looking for evidence of uh, neuroenhancement, um, it is a very interesting issue that sometimes you can miss when you look just at global outcome measures, perhaps the mean deviation. The fact that after glaucoma treatment, in particular after glaucoma surgery, there may be some points in the visual field that, that improve. And a number of different studies have, have shown this. Uh, Joe Caprioli and others have demonstrated after glaucoma surgery that there may be a portion of points where the visual field actually seems to improve. Now, it makes sense in glaucoma that there may be a, a population of ganglion cells that are still alive, not functioning optimally, but it's something that we struggle to, to um, find a way to measure. And I think the ability to pick up ganglion cells that are under stress um, would be a very useful way to enhance our ability to detect treatment effects of neuroprotective agents. In other words, if we could detect that cells were under stress before they had died and so a treatment um, has a beneficial effect on that stress response, then that would be uh, useful evidence, I think. And in the third um, question, I've forgotten it related to uh, neuroprotective agents. What we can use now, although there is no evidence base, what we can use now, and do we have to need neuroprotectors to all patients or maybe to a selective group of patients? Neuroprotectors to all or selective? Well, I think it depends on a number of factors. It depends on the, the relative risk benefit in, in individual patients. If we had something which was, was extremely safe, um, where there was a, a beneficial effect, then it is something that could be recommended widely. And, and and some of us do in clinical practice recommend um, patients who are perhaps progressing despite our best efforts to lower their, their, their pressure. Um, some, some recommend uh, ginkgo or cholesterol. Um, I, I also have an approach with these patients progressing when you don't know what's going on to think of other factors related to overtreating their, their blood pressure or obstructive sleep apnea or, or potentially uh, issues with pressure being applied to the eye during sleep. The 
strategies using, using other um, nutraceuticals, I think, could really use more evidence before they will be very widely adopted. But I know they're more popular in some countries than others, and there are a range of different treatments, for example, available in Italy. Um, that Stigma will be able to talk uh, more about that are that are not more widely available. Um, that that have the need for an enhanced um, evidence base. So, so I think a lot of these approaches. It's not the case that you know they, they don't work. It's a case that we could really use more evidence um, in in their support. And I think one of the major things we have to do in in glaucoma is to um, do more um, clinical trials. Um, and if we can find a way to shorten those trials so that we can do more cost-effective clinical trials of neuroprotective strategies, then that would help us to test some of these um, other approaches. Kirk, I'm Stefano. Uh, can I ask you something? Uh, maybe I missed it during your presentation, but what are your thoughts about two compounds? One is citricoline and the other one is coenzyme Q10. Actually, the coenzyme Q10 has been tried uh, by... by Francisca Cordero, and the Citricoline now has, has received a sort of approval from the Italian Ministry in order to support our, our IOP reduced treatment. So what are your feelings about these two compounds? And of course, I've not yet had a long-term clinical trial. Okay, so but anyway. Yes, you're That's right. So, so I'm aware, aware of the some some of the building evidence, and there's certainly for Cohen's and Q10. I've been quite impressed with some of the studies that have been done in that regard, both, both uh, mainly the animal studies actually, in terms of showing um, uh, enhanced effects. So Cohen's and Q10 works uh, in terms of enhancing mitochondrial function, uh, and there's growing evidence that mitochondrial dysfunction is an important part, uh, or may have an important part to play, at least in some of our patients with. Um, glaucoma, and so it's a logical approach um, to take. Um, the coenzyme Q strategy is a, a low-risk strategy, um, and I know that there is commercial development um, going on presently. Um, coenzyme Q trying to get this treatment more widely adopted um, ac across Europe, and the, there have been some interesting, um, s s relatively small-scale studies looking at the effect of these both of these treatments on on visual field performance. Now, clearly those are studies which are, uh, it's very important to exclude any form of uh, placebo effect. Uh, it's very important that, particularly for visual field studies, that patients in different groups are not aware of what treatment they're taking because that can affect uh, performance. So, so for both of these um, components, the, there is some um, theoretical mechanism um, there which makes sense. Um, and I, I think particularly for the um, Q10 story, I think it's something that I would really like to see tested in, in, in larger scale clinical trials because there is there is a reason to believe that this could be useful. Thank you. Uh, Keith, uh, что вы думаете? Keith, my final question. I know that we lose you in a few minutes, but anyway, what do you think about the neural growth factor, which is goes through phase two as the insulation eye drops? Do you think is it perspective or not? Please share. Again, I'm very interested in the potential use of growth factor uh, therapies for for glaucoma. I think um, um, and growth factors and trophic factors in many animal studies. Uh, in glaucoma have shown uh, beneficial effects. Um, I think the, the nerve growth factor eye drop story is, is an interesting one. I think it, I'm very pleased to see that this is actually um, progressing to the, the, the clinical trial stage and is into uh, phase two. Um, I think some of the data showing that the therapeutic or potentially therapeutic um, levels of NGF are achieved uh, in the vitreous following topical administration are important. Um, uh, but again, I think you know the, the main thing that I'm pleased to see we're we're very bad sometimes at predicting which of these treatments are are, are going to work in clinical practice, and uh, and the the fact that these trials are actually being done now I think is is important. So so we've had a a, a long period of time where we've had lots of potential neuroprotective treatments, but no real um, effective way to 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 test them in a cost effective way. And I think, you know, that is something that I, I, I really do hope is now starting to change. Thank you, Keith. Thank you very much. 
colleagues, do you have any other questions uh, to Professor Martin? Keith, thank you very much. Well, hoping seeing you one day in Moscow. Uh, thank you very much. And I certainly have to, uh, apologies that I have to leave to go to the uh, operating room now, but uh, I, I hope to join you someday in Moscow for one of your meetings and uh, enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thank you, Keith. Have a good luck. Colleagues, can we switch to Varonish? Varonish is saying that they do have questions to Professor Rich. Professor Rich, uh, hopefully he is with us, because uh, we were planning to have webcast up to 4 p.m., so, and it will be 8 a.m. in New York, so yet we have seven minutes left. Seven minutes, so questions from Varonish. You're welcome, you're welcome. Okay, uh, we are waiting uh, uh, for the colleagues in Maronish. There is another question to Professor Silva, who demonstrated us the clinical case. Can we see? Can we see Dr. Silva? Dr. Silva? Yes, hello. The question is that the clinical case you, that you demonstrated, very interesting case. Uh, my question. Vapros and the clinical case. So the clinical case demonstrated very uh, obviously that pseudo-exfoliative syndrome is vasculopathia. This is microcirculatory disorder. And you demonstrated brilliant case when there is acute uh, uh, retinal infarction that currently can be diagnosed using OCT angio. And you very briefly mentioned this method in your clinical case report. By the way, we and other authors managed to show the role of this method is in glaucoma diagnosis in the world. About one year and a half ago, we demonstrated that the reduction of the density of the capillary flow in the macula could be a very early diagnostic marker in this, in this disease, going even a hold, a ahead of ganglia changes and RNFL changes. What do you think? What are the prospects of this method of OCT angio in the diagnosis of glaucoma and the exploitative glaucoma specifically? Yes, we're gaining uh, a lot of experience with uh, OCT and geography, and uh, now we have an accessible test to evaluate blood vessel density in the retina. And um, actually, we, we presented a poster in the last ARVO uh, comparing the, the structural correlation of decreased blood vessel density at the macula and loss of retinal ganglion cells in the same area. Uh, now, the interesting question is uh, now to know which one comes first. Maybe there are certain glaucomas where there is a decreased um, um, perfusion um, where you will have initial decrease of the blood vessel density, or maybe there are other cases where apoptosis of the retinal ganglion cells occur first. But definitely the OCT angiography has come to stay and uh, now we can actually see, as there are some studies um, showing the decreased blood vessel density in areas with retinal ganglion cell um, decrease, and then the retinal, uh, the parapapillary area also with retinal fiber layer defects. Uh, Thank you very much. And I would like to add on about a very important Californian study. Uh, yep. Can you? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? One, two, three, sound check. Move us. Where do I take this? Okay. Here? No. Well, this is very good that we were uh, in this webcast for a long time. Can you hear now? Uh, now it's back on. Yeah, I, uh, we want to know if we answer the question. I'm simply saying that glaucoma monitoring, as California study showed, uh, that angiomacula can be very prospective. Yes, I know there is one minute before you will go to the OR. Could you somehow sum up our um, webcast today? Maybe some final comments, Professor Rich?
one minute of final comments. I would say exfoliation is the most recognizable cause of open angle glaucoma in the world. If we can eliminate it, we can eliminate 20% of the world's open angle glaucoma. We have now found seven genes for this. We have to figure out how they relate together, but most of them are related to the extracellular matrix. And if we can regulate lock cell one production, we can regulate the uh, production of exfoliation. And the other thing we found is that this is a disease of autophagy that the lysosomes do not bind to the microtubules and translocate to the center of the cell. The cells are twice the size of POAG cells, and the microtubule organizing center is all messed up. It's on the outside of the membrane instead of on the inside of the nuclear membrane. I've been trying to get somebody to do exfoliation, to do electron microscopy on this for three years. We haven't yet gotten it done. I would love to have somebody in the audience there who's interested in electron microscopy take a look at the microtubule organizer. And there are still numerous findings based on that to help us to until we completely understand the uh, the pathophysiology, the cell biology of exfoliation. And then we have the other things down the line that could treat it. But the best thing, the best thing to approach this is to work out the mechanism and prevent it from causing glaucoma in the first place. And that's the goal that we have to aim for. It's been a pleasure uh, seeing all of you. I wish we had more time. We could do this again. If we did this on a Sunday, uh, we could spend a few hours doing it. So thank you all for attending, and uh, we'll see you again another time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Colleagues, um, I would like to sum up our webcast. Of course, this is very limited time. This is very limited time because, in fact, there were extremely many questions. And I couldn't give the microphone to anyone in this audience. But please, don't worry. We will have this uh, opportunity because Stefano, Vladimir, and Professor Malugin will join us later. We will answer all these questions. But the most important that you can provide your questions, I'm referring to the regions and all those who are listening to us online, you can provide your questions in writing and to send them to the website of the symposium so those people who we are talking today are so big enthusiasts uh, and they will be happy to answer your questions i will be sort of a translator between you and them but this is very real and we can get these answers and i think that's the most important idea of this event of this symposium today because this is really the webcast this is open space we have no borders all over the world so we cannot be isolated any anymore we are all united with the same challenges that we are to resolve. So now I think we deserved a little bit of coffee break. Of course, it was not easy symposium.